Leslie Wade, the Education Programs Manager here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And I'm standing here on our 25 by 25 foot surface map of Mars. Moon Day was established in 2009 at the museum in collaboration with the National Space Society of North Texas and its former president, Ken Murphy. Ken Ruffin, its current president, has prepared a presentation about the past and present exploration of Mars. Welcome to the 12th annual Moon Day at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. My name is Ken Ruffin. I'm the president of the National Space Society of North Texas, and I'm proud to present this webinar for Moon, for Moon Day on Mars exploration, past and present. This is the table of contents for the presentation where I will begin with an introduction. I will discuss past uh, Mars missions, present Mars mission, present Mars missions, and conclusions. For the introduction, uh, first I'd like to compare Earth and Mars, uh, the number of days that each planet takes to orbit the sun, with Earth being the third planet in distance from the sun, Mars being the fourth. Earth, Earth takes 365.25 days on average uh, to orbit the sun, that's one year. And one year on Mars, time it takes to orbit the sun is 686 days, uh, which is about 22 months. Mars's gravity is about 38% of Earth's gravity. Mars receives about 44% of the sunlight that Earth receives. And Mars's atmosphere, and this is certainly important information, it's 1% uh, the thickness uh, or density of Earth's atmosphere, actually a little less than 1%. And whereas Earth's atmosphere is primarily nitrogen and oxygen, uh, as you can see, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. And as I mentioned before, less than 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere. In this photo, this composite photo, uh, these are the two moons of Mars, Deimos on the left, the, the smaller moon, and Phobos on the right. Uh, Deimos is approximately 10 miles um, for its longest dimension, and Phobos is approximately 18 miles in its longest dimension. And the uh, measurements that you see are in kilometers. Those two moons that were just discussed, uh, Deimos, the outermost and smallest moon, is uh, pictured as you see here, the outermost, and Phobos, the larger moon, is uh, orbits closer to Mars. Now, what, what's not apparent from this photo, or from this image, is that Phobos is not only closer to Mars in its orbit, it also has been gradually getting closer and closer over time so that eventually, perhaps in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, Phobos will crash into Mars. Whereas Deimos, uh, the moon that's again orbiting farther from Mars, has been gradually orbiting farther and farther from Mars so that at some point over perhaps millions of years, Deimos will no longer orbit Mars and will leave Mars's orbit and uh, orbit the sun. So at some point in the future, perhaps in a few, mil few million years, Mars will not have any moons. Now, this is a graphic of the robotic missions to Mars. And uh, the font is uh, pretty small. So I'll explain. If you think in terms of a clock at the top of the image, 12 o'clock, that's going back to the early 1960s and going counterclockwise, those are missions uh, going uh, from the 1960s through the 70s, 80s, all the way up to present missions. The missions that are in red um, in the 1960s are missions or were missions from the former Soviet Union and the missions that are in blue are from or were from the United States. 
uh, through NASA. So there were several missions uh, en route to Mars uh, intended to be flyby missions sent from the Soviet Union, as well as a lander that were mission failures, the first several missions, as well as the first mission in blue from uh, NASA before there was a successful flyby uh, that was Mariner 4 in 1965, and we'll discuss, I'll discuss more about that in a moment. And as you can see, there have been several uh, dozen missions to Mars, all robotic missions. Uh, most have been successful, and most of the successful missions were from the United States via NASA. Now, for part one, they passed Mars missions, and as you can see, and as you saw on the on the previous slide, there have been dozens, and I'll go in order, uh, in chronological order. Here's an image on the left of Mariner 3. Um, this was a mission failure prior to Mariner 4. Uh, the Mars flyby, the first successful Mars flyby, was July 15th of 1965, so approximately uh, 55 years ago. As of the time of this recording, Mariner 4 took the first ever photograph of Mars, uh, this black and white photograph that you see here. Mariner 6 uh, identified the frozen carbon dioxide, more commonly, commonly known as dry ice, at the Mars South Polar region. And Mariner 7 took the first uh, color photograph of Mars and the first photograph of uh, Mars's moon Phobos. Timing-wise, Mariner 7 occurred at, at what must have been a really exciting time in, I should say, on August 5th of 1969. It was just a couple of weeks after the very first moon landing. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landing on the moon, walking on the moon, and then returning to Earth in July, followed by a couple of weeks later, the first color photo taken by a robotic spacecraft from Mars. So certainly an exciting time in exploration. Certainly exciting time in space exploration. Mariner 8 launched uh, May 9th, 1971. That was a mission failure. However, the following mission, Mariner 9 in November of 71, uh, was the first Mars orbiter and it mapped, uh, photographed 85% of Mars's surface. And the photo is of Barris Marineris, the uh, largest canyon in the solar system. It dwarfs the Grand Canyon on Earth. Viking 1 and 2. Uh, this was, or these missions occurred um, at the year of the, the bicentennial year, uh, the 200th anniversary of, of the United States of America. And uh, on the, the image on the left is of astronomer Carl Sagan, who was not on Mars. Um, no humans have been to Mars. Uh, this is a replica of the Viking 1 lander and uh, the legendary astronomer Carl Sagan posing beside it on the left, whereas on the right is an actual photo of a Viking lander on Mars. And I would consider this a Mars selfie. Um, it hasn't gotten recognition as a, a selfie on Mars, but uh, and not only a selfie, but the first selfie on Mars. So I, I think it should be recognized for that. All right, then um, the Mars Observer was a mission failure, followed by the Mars Global Surveyor, surveyor uh, that identified for the first time water-related minerals. Uh, this was an orbiter, and um, it determined future uh, landing sites, or a future landing site on Mars. That future landing site was for the Mars Pathfinder lander and the Sojourner rover. Uh, back in 1997, the Pathfinder lander included or contained the, the small microwave oven-sized Sojourner rover named after Sojourner Truth. So these are uh, 
these are replicas of those uh, of, of those uh, NASA probes. And so Sojourner was the first rover on Mars. Then there were unfortunately two mission failures, um, two back-to-back -back mission failures, the Mars Climate Orbiter and the Mars Polar Lander in 1999. So at the time, NASA was under a tremendous amount of pressure and scrutiny uh, where there was a, a, an, a, an expectation, a large need for NASA to have a successful robotic Mars mission. So after the two mission failures, the Mars Phoenix lander successfully conducted its mission at Mars in 2008. Uh, Phoenix as in the mythical Phoenix that rose from the ashes. So this was a lander that, uh, that operated near the North Pole of Mars and analyzed um, the soil, uh, analyzed not soil, but the dust uh, at the mar near the Martian North Pole and determined uh, or confirmed water ice uh, being present at that location. And Phoenix took over 25,000 photos uh, from, uh, from its location on Mars. Then this mission was not designed or intended to specifically be a Mars mission. However, the Dawn asteroid probe uh, developed by NASA traveled past Mars in order to get a gravity assist on its way to the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, which is Ceres. This mission uh, used a, a near-infrared camera to get that uh, uh, gravity assist to, to gain a, additional velocity. And the Mars, I'm sorry, the Dawn asteroid probe itself was uh, what well, was and is powered by solar electric propulsion. So the uh, additional velocity that it gained going by Mars uh, was valuable in being able to reach Ceres and to get there in a shorter amount of time. There were two twin Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, Spirit as you see here, uh, operated on Mars for a period of six years. Note that each of these Mars exploration rovers uh, had a primary mission which was scheduled for 90 days. And any additional time beyond the 90 days was just that much more uh, valuable, that much more important in being able to conduct uh, thousands of additional science experiments and take a, taking additional photos, additional measurements. So we gained a tremendous amount of information from not only spirit, but also opportunity. Opportunities, uh, opportunity was the rover that, that, that functioned on Mars for little, well, the, the mission total time was 15 years. And again, the the minimum uh, expected uh, operation from the unit was, or from the mission was uh, three months. So uh, valuable, uh, very valuable, very important missions. The photo on the upper right-hand corner was actually taken by Opportunity as it was uh, located at the rim of an enormous crater. And so at the rim, at the edge of the crater, and this rover actually drove partially down into the crater, conducted uh, analyses, and drove back out of the crater. So that concludes the past Mars missions, those missions which are no longer in operation. So now I want to go through the list of the several ongoing or present missions at Mars. Starting with Mars Odyssey, this is an orbiter which has been in operation since October of 2001, so 
approaching at the time of this recording 19 years of operation and it um, not only has uh, taken uh, photographs of Mars it's also used its spectrometers to determine various elements present on the Mars surface and it also has conducted uh, radiation analyses and determined that the level of radiation that a human would be exposed to if it uh, for any humans in a spacecraft orbiting Mars uh, that radiation level is twice the radiation that astronauts would exceed would, would experience in a spacecraft orbiting Earth. So next Mars Express has been orbiting Mars since 2003 and this is a joint ESA European Space Agency and NASA mission, um, primarily a European Space Agency mission. And it's been studying the solar winds effect on Mars's atmosphere. And it also has ground penetrating radar, which determined in July of 2018 that there may be liquid water, whether it's a, a lake, uh, for example, um, that's underneath a layer of ice at Mars's South Pole. And that ice may be frozen water as well as uh, frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice. So uh, that was a, a historic uh, announcement in July of 2018. So that's, a, that's one of the potential sources of water for uh, people who eventually are, in, are intended or, or where, where there are plans for people to go to Mars. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, has been operating since March of 2006, and it has um, determined from, from its analyses that there had been water on or near the surface of Mars for a period of hundreds of millions of years uh, before the atmosphere became thin enough that the water that, that uh, the majority of the water perhaps evaporated. And there's still, of course, the potential that there's liquid water in other places, liquid or frozen water, in, in other locations besides at the south pole of Mars, maybe beneath the surface in other locations. An additional finding by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, because it's been in Mars orbit for so many years. It's been able to photograph the same locations on Mars at different times. So in the photograph on the left, um, you, the, the, not just from visual, visual inspection, but also from the use of spectrometers, in the photograph on the left, uh, the surface is dry. However, in the photo on the right, there are dark streaks and the spectrometers verified that those dark streaks were temporary um, flows of salt water, liquid salt water, which occurred um, near the equator at the hottest time of the day uh, during the, a summer month. So uh, uh, during summer on Mars, so it's temporary seasonal um, salt water has been um, detected from the MRO orbiter. Now, one of the, I'll, I'll say perhaps the most famous rover on Mars, at least to date, is the Mars Science Laboratory, also known as Curiosity. And the photo you see here is actually a composite photograph uh, it's a Mars selfie. Uh, Curiosity took uh, several, uh, actually a couple of dozen photographs, and uh, the photos were, were overlapped and arranged uh, such that this is the result of Curiosity taking a photo of itself.
among the many uh, NASA employees and contractors uh, working on Curiosity, uh, going back to not only the construction, uh, people working on it then, but people specifically working with the EDL, the Entry, Descent, and Landing. One of the more famous individuals uh, who <laughs> he became famous during the time of the Entry, Descent, and Landing is pictured here with me, uh, Bobak Ferdowsi, aerospace engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. At the time, uh, Bobak Ferdowsi had a Mohawk. So that was completely different than the, the uh, stereotypical usual image that people have in mind when they think of NASA engineers. So he received a, a, a very large amount of attention uh, at the time because of his Mohawk and he got the nickname Mohawk Guy. So through the National Space Society, I was able to meet uh, Mr. Ferdowsi at uh, one of our annual conferences and I was kind enough, or he was kind enough, I should say, to uh, pose for this picture with me. Uh, I, I told him that I knew of some of the fans that he had and um, I just couldn't wait to show them uh, the picture of he and I together. So um, again, curiosity. This is an image of the variety of instruments that Curiosity has. Uh, Curiosity is primarily a geology um, um, a mission, or maybe you can call it an astrogeology mission, where it's studying the geology of Mars and with a variety of different instruments, conducting a variety of different tests. You may or may not have heard about an, a, a rover on Mars with a laser. Well, you can see from this image here, the ChemCan. Uh, the purpose of the laser is not to defend Curiosity from any aliens, but it is to, uh, to, to analyze volatile uh, substances. The laser heats those volatile uh, chemicals so that they would evaporate, and then there are other instruments that, uh, including a spectrometer, that determines which elements are present. And so Curiosity is able to study, you know, different um, materials by using, of course, ChemCam, as well as using the drill that's uh, located on the uh, right center of the image and a variety of other instruments. So um, Curiosity has been quite valuable in increasing humanity's knowledge of Mars. This is an image taken on Earth of, of the three types of rovers uh, that uh, are currently uh, on Mars, the three types of NASA rovers. The smallest one uh, on near the bottom left is the Sojourner um, rover and uh, center left that's representing either Spirit or Opportunity, those twin rovers. And then on the right is the Mars Curiosity rover. Also, orbiting Mars, there is MAVEN. This is a yet another NASA orbiter, Mars Atmospheric and Volatile Evolution. MAVEN is the acronym. It's been orbiting Mars since September of 2014. And MAVEN has been providing information about how, about the loss of Mars's atmosphere, uh, the rate of loss of Mars's atmosphere. To explain the reason for the loss of atmosphere, Earth, by comparison, has a magnetic field, which is generated by uh, liquid, or I should say molten iron in the outer core of the planet Earth. Well, Mars originally, according to scientists, also had a molten iron core 
Um, however, with Mars being much less massive, much smaller, uh, the molten core has cooled and solidified and is no longer generating a magnetic field around Mars. So as a result for perhaps three billion years, the solar wind from the sun has been stripping away Mars's atmosphere to the point where the density or the thickness of Mars's atmosphere is only 1%, as I've mentioned in the introduction, 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. So it's the atmosphere that allows a substance like water to remain liquid and um, and a thick, a dense atmosphere is required for that, such as what we have on Earth. But without Mars having a dense atmosphere, uh, liquid, or I should say water, uh, could not remain in a liquid state um, for very long, if at all. So Mars has no bodies of liquid water on its surface. Temporary seasonal water, which evaporates quickly, but no standing uh, liquid water. So MAVEN since 2014 has given uh, a tremendous amount of information about Mars's atmosphere and climate. There are eight instruments on MAVEN studying um, the atmosphere of Mars and, and the interaction with or the interaction between the solar wind, solar wind from the sun, and Mars's atmosphere. There is another orbiter. This is the first orbiter from the nation of India, uh, the Mars Orbiter Mission, and the acronym for that is MOM, and it has been orbiting Mars since September of 2014, and when, in, after 2015, uh, the Indian Space Agency wanted to celebrate that one year anniversary of, of MOM orbiting Mars, uh, the Indian Space Agency created a Mars Atlas available for purchase with the best um, photos taken by MOM during that first year of its mission. Next, uh, the European Space Agency and Roscosmos had have a joint mission, um, what was intended to be the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter um, and the Schiaparelli Lander. The orbiter is still in operation orbiting Mars. However, uh, the lander um, is experienced a uh, experienced mission failure when it contacted Mars at an extremely high rate of speed um, above and beyond the speed that it was designed to have when it reached the surface of Mars. So um, the lander is not in operation, has not operated, but the trace gas orbiter continues to operate. This image shows the various instruments on the trace gas orbiter, uh, which began operation in October of 2016, uh, studying uh, various gases from Mars that could be evidence of biological or geological processes on Mars. In other words, could be signs of life or could be signs of active geology uh, such as earthquakes or volcanoes. So it's conducting those analyses, studying the atmosphere uh, from Mars orbit and studying trace gases in the atmosphere uh, from the orbit of Mars, from Mars's orbit. Another lander, Mars InSight. And InSight is an acronym for Interior Exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy, and heat transport. So the purpose of InSight is to study the interior of Mars. 
Uh, InSight is studying to detect um, whether or not there are Mars earthquakes and their frequency and intensity. And as you can see from this image, there are a variety of other instruments for a number of different types of studies, as well as communicating information, communicating data. Uh, you see uh, there's a UHF antenna as well that's able to send, or that's there to send data to at least one of the orbiters to relay data back to Earth. And any lander or rover on the surface of Mars sends its data to at least one of the orbiters that have been discussed, and those orbiters relay that data back to Earth. So this is a graphic of the various locations of orbiters and landers on Mars, past and present. Now, this is just a portrayal. This does not indicate that Mars is flat, uh, not by any means. Uh, this is just a way to, to show the various locations um, it, with respect to the poles. For example, Phoenix is near uh, the northern pole of Mars, and most of the other missions are near the equator of Mars. Uh, you can see, for example, comparing the location of Viking 1 and Viking 2, each one is in a different hemisphere. Each one is about halfway around the distance of the planet than the other, uh, and it's a similar case for spirit and opportunity. Each one landed in a different hemisphere, so they're, they're essentially half a world apart and have been able to conduct studies of, relative, of, of significantly different terrains on Mars uh, at the same time. In conclusion, um, there has been a significant amount of activity on Mars, past and present, and uh, this is sort of a sneak peek. In the future, there are plans for people to go to Mars, and, and these are plans not only from space agencies like NASA, but also even from private companies, where the companies would send paying passengers to move to Mars uh, to live, to become space settlers on Mars. So this is just a heads up for that. This is a photograph uh, taken from the Mars Curiosity rover looking back at the planet Earth. And uh, it's a photograph with, of course, um, the name Earth and the arrow added to the photograph. Uh, so when, when those people whether it's astronauts, whether it's settlers, are on the planet Mars and they look back towards home, this is the type of view that they can expect to have. There has been in science fiction stories and TV series and movies, a significant amount of attention uh, about terraforming Mars to make Mars more Earth-like so that uh, people would be able to walk around on the surface of Mars without a spacesuit, without the need for, um, for oxygen, without the need for the pressure that uh, the spacesuit uh, provides with the, due to Mars's atmospheric pressure being so low. However, this is a graphic from NASA that in summary explains that if all of the carbon dioxide was released from Mars, whether it's carbon dioxide in at the polar caps, the frozen carbon dioxide or dry ice, whether it's carbon dioxide in minerals, whether it's carbon dioxide in any form from any location on any and every location on Mars, that total pressure, the total atmospheric pressure of Mars would go from being 
the current less than 1% that it is now up to about 7% of Earth's atmospheric uh, pressure. Therefore, despite what we may have seen and heard and read about, uh, whether it's from science fiction or, or whether it's from some noted scientists and engineers, who, uh, one of whom may happen to be a billionaire celebrity owner of a spacecraft company um, and rocket company, the findings from NASA are that even if all carbon dioxide is released, 7% uh, at Mars's atmosphere would be 7% the, the thickness of Earth's atmosphere, which would not make Mars suitable for being able to maintain liquid water on its surface. Uh, it would not uh, allow for plants to be uh, grown on the surface, which would uh, convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. Uh, none of the the things that here on Earth we're able to take for granted on Earth's surface, you know, the the density of our air, the the uh, percentage of oxygen in our atmosphere that could not be uh, recreated on Mars. And this is NASA's finding, as you can see, not only from the graph, but from us. For more information, there's a link on the screen at mars.nasa.gov, and you can see the rest there. It's uh, <laughs> There's very little information because it's uh, a pretty straightforward um, determination by NASA. And... Uh, and last but not least, uh, thank you for uh, for watching this presentation on Moon Day. Um, again, I'm Ken Ruffin with the National Space Society of North Texas. For anyone who's interested in getting more information like this, uh, whether it's about Mars or, or uh, other destinations uh, in our solar system, we, the National Space Society of North Texas has monthly webinar meetings on the second Sundays of each month. Uh, the meetings begin at 3.30. The presentations are from 4 to 5, and this is Central Time. And um, again, for Moon Day guests, well, first of all, the presentation that I gave today was part one of a three-part a set of presentations the National Space Society is giving. Part two will be on August 9th, 2020, part three on September 13th, 2020. And uh, Moon Day guests are welcome to consider joining the National Space Society as well as uh, the National Space Society of North Texas, the award-winning chapter, uh, 2014, 2016, and 2019, National Space Society Chapter of the Year. Um, Yes, if you join, you will uh, not only, of course, get National Space Society uh, membership when you join, but you'll have a one-year complimentary membership to the National Space Society of North Texas. If you would like uh, more information about the National Space Society of North Texas, my email address is on the screen. I'm at ken.ruffin at nss.org. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, please continue to enjoy Moon Day 12 in the year 2020, our virtual Moon Day. And um, again, let me know if you have questions about the National Space Society of North Texas. Thank you very much.